All right, here we go. So, um, <laughs> go back to relative motion here, all right? Oh boy. So, we're, we're back into things moving around uh, with respect to each other. We're going to look at acceleration this time. So, uh, 260, I think. 270, because we, we or, no, yeah, we did, we did 260, all right? So what we did there for 260 is just like we did on recitation. We uh, looked at the two velocities on 260. We vectorized them, and we got that relative velocity equation set up. We vectorized the velocities based on the angles, and then we just solved out that basic relative motion equation. Now we can do relative acceleration too. It's just a little bit uh, more involved because acceleration on a curve can have two components. So why don't we have a look at that? Okay. So what we want to do here is set up the relative acceleration equation and you want to set it up again. It's important that you get the thing set up properly. So I got a sub a is a sub b plus a sub a with respect to b. That gets everything lined out right so the vectors are added properly. So, um, what I want to do then is I want to find vector expressions for these things. Because again, this relative motion stuff is all about vectors. So the first one that's pretty easy is a sub a. So what we're doing, we're looking down on a, a ramp here on I-5. We've got one car coming in on the ramp, and we've got another car on the highway. Yeah, well, no, it's accelerating the wrong way. I think what's going on is the car is looking at B and going, hmm, maybe I need to give B some room to get in. So A is starting to slow down a little bit, okay? And we've got the velocities and we've got the acceleration. So B is speeding up, A is slowing down. And we want to get the, the, all this stuff in a vector sense. So if I want A sub A, it looks like I'm going to go, what, 0i? minus 0.90j, okay? So there's an expression for the acceleration of A. And that's the, the easier of the two. Because what's going on there is B is on a curve, and it, being as it's on a curve, it's going to have two potential uh, components of acceleration because we got the tangential going that way and the normal going that way okay so we just have to get that worked out and there's kind of a couple of steps to go through the first thing we want to do is get the normal and tangential accelerations okay and then once we've got those we got to get those uh, the fancy word is transformed to an xy coordinate system and this is, again, one of those common things that we do. We start with the curve stuff quite often on a normal tangential coordinate system because the, the motion aligns to that coordinate system. But then you've got to do some angular trig kind of stuff to get that put over onto a XY coordinate system. So that, that's pretty common for it to go this way. All right, so what do we got for B? What, what's the tangential acceleration there for B? We got that. It's just right there. Yeah, 2.1. That, that's, that's what it's doing, okay? It's going in that direction at 2.1 meters per second squared. So B speeding up. That means that B is pushing on the accelerator and making the car go faster. All right. Now the normal, what's the, what's the normal acceleration going to be on that? What are we going to do? We're going to, okay, we got the velocity of that thing, two, nope, not 2.1, what do we got, 20? Okay, so we got the velocity, that's on that, it's in the problem statement, it's on the previous page too, so that's 20. That's meters per second. You square that, and then you divide it by the radius, 120 meters. So keep in mind that that has nothing to do with the 
tangential acceleration of the car. It's just about the speed of the car. Okay. So if you take that speed square and divide it by the radius, you get 3.33. So what's up here is now we have the acceleration of the car in normal and tangential coordinates. And, and that's often step one because they're aligned right with the two different directions of motion and acceleration. So it's pretty straight up to get those. But then what has to happen next is those need to be transformed to an XY coordinate system. And to do that, I've got the sketch on the right. Okay, so what's up here is we've got axes set up like that. So that's normal and that's tangential. That's a 90 between them. And we're given this angle right here. So by parallel angles, you know, in geometry, that ought to be the same angle. So we got the 53 up top, and we just can come up with the 53 down below. Okay. Now, once we got that, we got 180 for a flat line, the horizontal line. We got a 90 degree angle in there, and we got 53. So what we end up with then is 37. And that's over here, okay? So we want to get these angles in here figured up so that we can vectorize the normal and tangential components. Okay. So I've got the sketch then with the angles on it, the, the 53 and the 37. And there's the calculation that gets them. So the parallel angles gets you the 53, and then 180 minus 90 minus 53 gets you 37. Okay. So we're good. So then we just go ahead and take each one of those separately and use the angle, um, and then the and then the acceleration, and we can get the different components. So the tangential is going up left at 37 degrees. So minus for left cosine 37 times 2.1. That's the i. And then the normal is going up right at 53. So the, um, I'm, I'm sorry, for the tangential, it's negative cosine 37, 2.1i plus sine 37, 2.1j. And then that gets you the tangential, one, negative 1.68i because it's going to the left, and 1.26j because it's going up. And then we do the same sort of thing with the normal, 53 degree angle. 3.33 magnitude, so cosine 53, 3.33i, plus sine 53, 3.33j. And that gets you 2i plus 2.67j. Okay. So those are the two components, and they're vectorized now into x's and y's. So we add up the x's, we add up the y's, and we get the total. So there's what a, b is. It's 0.32i plus 3.93j. And then we just go ahead and run that through our vector equation, okay? Because I got a sub a, I got a sub b, so I can find the relative acceleration. Okay. So a sub a is 0 minus point, 0 i minus 0 0.9 j, that's on the left. And then I got 0.32 i plus 3.93 j on the right, plus the relative acceleration components the x and the y with their i and j unit vectors. Okay. So to solve that thing, you solve the x's and the y's separately. So I just pull out the x's. So 0 is 0 0.32 plus abx, or excuse me, a, a with respect to bx. So the acceleration of a with respect to b is negative 0.32. So from b's point of view, a is accelerating down south, you might say. And then you do the same thing. No, I'm sorry, that's x. My bad. Okay. That's negative 0.32. So with respect to A, B is accelerating to the uh, to the left. All right. That's what the negative means. The J equation, we've got um, Negative 0.9 is 3.93. Okay. 
plus a a with respect to b y so the relative acceleration of a with respect to b in the y direction is negative 4.83 so what's happening there is a is accelerating south b is accelerating north so um, it looks like um, from b's perspective a is accelerating south pretty rapidly so it looks to me like as this merge happens a is going to end up up here, leaving B enough room to get in. That's what's going on. Okay. So if you're in B looking at A, from your point of view, it appears to be going to the left, which is west, and then down, which is south. Or at least appears to be accelerating that way, I should say. Okay. All right, and then that's just a vector, so we can take square root of sum of the squares and get 4.84, and then work out the angle, 86.2 degrees with an arc tan. All right. So we got any questions on that? So that's uh, a bit of kinematics, we call it, okay? Just looking at motion. So we kind of started with the linear stuff with the calculus equations, then we did the curve linear stuff, and then we did a couple side topics. We did uh, relative motion and uh, pulley systems. All right, let's have a look now at some kinetics, okay? So what we've been doing so far here is we just look at motion and we say, okay, here's the motion, analyze it. Let's start to look at, um, at what causes the motion in the first place. Okay. So let's look on page 280 and start having a look at that. All right, uh, you know, Isaac Newton here came up with a lot of this stuff. So Newton, you know, pretty smart fellow, came up with this stuff. Um, we can boil down his um, second law as F equals MA. Now, this is a vector equation. And what this says is if you apply a force to an object, if you push or pull on something, what it's going to do, if there's a net force on it, is accelerate in the same direction as the force. So if there's an unbalanced force, so if the object is not in equilibrium, if it has an unbalanced force, it'll accelerate in the direction you apply the force. Okay. The larger the force, the more the acceleration. That's basically what that says. Now we can deal with this in a couple different units. Okay. All right. Um, we can deal with it in the SI, an international system, metric system. Force is Newton. Mass is kilogram. And acceleration is meter per second squared. So what that tells us is one Newton, which is the force, is a mass of a kilogram accelerated at one meter per second squared. So that's an equivalent for units. A Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Okay. Now, if we're in what's called the imperial system, we got pounds, we got a mass unit that's a little unusual called slugs, and then our acceleration is foot per second squared. So one pound is one slug foot per second squared. Okay, so those are the units that we use for this F equals MA. 
Now we got a special case on account of the Earth's constant gravitational field that tells us our weight is our mass times gravity. Okay. So the, the weight will change depending on which gravitational field you're in, whereas the mass will not. So if you ever watch movies of the astronauts when they're walking on the moon, when they walk, they kind of hop because their muscles are made for Earth's gravity, which is much stronger than the moon's. So they kind of jump as they walk, just for normal walking. Okay. All right, so a simple example of this, if we got a block, I don't think I've got this in your notes anywhere. And let's say we're going to uh, apply an 80 pound force to it. We don't have any friction. Let's see what the acceleration would be. We got the weight is 300 pounds. Now weight is a force, so keep that in mind. So you'd probably want to find the mass. And what that is, is the force of the weight divided by the acceleration due to gravity. So what I'm going to do to this thing is apply an equation, F equals MA. Okay. Well, I need those, uh, the M and the A, and I got F, and I can find the mass. I'm going to need that so I can find the acceleration. Okay. So the first thing I have to do is figure out what the mass of the thing is. So I'll take the weight and I'll divide it by gravity. Okay. So sum of F is MA and weight is mass times gravity. I can just take that weight and divide it by gravity and that will get me a mass in what are called slugs. So the mass of this thing is 9.32 slugs. And I got F equals MA. All right. So now I got enough stuff that I can solve this thing. Okay, now I'm going to apply the equation F equals MA to this. Now, I'm going to do this in a real conscious way, and I'm going to do this consistently through the class. So not only am I going to try and teach you the concept behind this, but I'm also going to try and teach you a method. Okay. So, and this might be a little different than what you learned in physics. I'm not sure, but this is how I'm going to do it, and this is a consistent way to approach these things so we get everything straight. Okay. So on the left, I'm going to use the forces. Now, sometimes I'll call F the static side. That has the forces and the weights because that's what you put into a statics equation. And when you do statics, of course, the sum of the forces and weights is zero. Okay. Weight is a type of force. Okay. The right I'm going to call the dynamic side. That has the masses and accelerations. So what I'm going to do to solve all these problems is get a free body diagram, write up an equation with the forces and weights on the left, the masses and accelerations on the right. I'm going to be very careful about my signs. So it's important that you get everything on the proper side of the equation and you got the proper sign on it. Those are the things you got to watch. And then I'll just solve it. Okay, that's how I'm going to do this stuff. And I'll be very intentional on how I'm doing it that way. Okay. So this is a fairly simple one. I got 80 pounds of force. I got 9.32 slugs of uh, mass. I can solve for A, it's 8.59 feet per second squared. Okay. That's how I would do that. So any questions on this stuff? All right, now let's kind of go to the next page here and let's just look at, um, at one other little kind of side topic that relates to this, and this is friction. Because okay. quite often when we're dealing with these things moving around, we got to deal with friction. So let's have a look. This is 290. You might have had this in statics, maybe maybe not, probably had it in physics if you took that. 
Okay, friction is a reactive force. It resists sliding. There's two types of friction, actually, dry and lubricated, okay? Lubricated friction depends on the properties of the lubricant. So if you look at uh, your motor oil, you know, it's like 5W30 or something like that. Those, those numbers call out the characteristics of the, of the oil. We're not going to get into that. That's more of a mechanical engineering thing, okay? We're going to do dry friction. But just understand if you know if you're doing friction, it, which kind you're doing really makes a difference. Okay, we're going to do dry friction, which is a little simpler. It's just basically dragging one object across another, and think of the surfaces of the two as having little hooks in, in them that kind of grab and resist motion. So the harder the objects are pushed together, the more the friction. Okay. So what you do before you find friction is you find the normal force, the force of the object, of the force of the surface pushing up on the object. Then you find the maximum friction by just uh, taking that normal force times whatever your coefficient of friction is. Okay. So I've got a kind of a simple example here. A box on a horizontal surface. I'm going to push on it with 30 newtons. Okay, let's see what's going on with this thing. Let's find the net force acting on the box. It's a 40 newton box and I've got the coefficient of friction is 0.25. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to sum forces in the normal direction. Solve for the normal force. That's 40 newtons. I'm going to take um, then. I'm going to take that and multiply it by the coefficient of friction. Okay. So the force of friction is mu times the normal. Mu is this coefficient of friction, which describes basically how rough the surfaces are. Multiply that by 40. I get 10 newtons. So I got 30 newtons to the right and 10 newtons pushing back. So the net force on this box is 20 newtons. Okay. So to find the friction, you find the normal force first. Then you multiply that by the coefficient of friction. Okay. All right, now there's actually two coefficients of dry friction. There's the static and kinetic. Um, use the static before there's any sliding, then use the kinetic after there's sliding. Generally speaking, the static is larger than the kinetic. But if it's moving, you use the kinetic. If, it's, if you're going to see if it's going to move, you'd use the static. Okay. All right, now here's another example here. All right, now here's another little thing. When you're working with friction, remember it's a reactive force. So let's say we got mu at 0.5 here, and we got an 80 newton uh, weight. Okay, I'd go ahead and solve for the normal force. It'd be 80 newtons. Then I multiply that by 0.5, and that would be 40 newtons. Okay. So when I run through these numbers, that's 40 newtons pushing. Now, keep in mind, that's the maximum potential friction. Because if you look at this sketch, if I'm only pushing on the box with 30, I'm not going to develop 40 on the other side for friction. Friction reacts. It doesn't just appear and go to immediately to its maximum. So this friction is going to be 30 newtons, and the box isn't going to move, okay? Because if the friction went all the way to its maximum, mu Fn, the net force would be to the left. And I don't think you're going to push on a box to the right and have it move to the left. That, that's not going to happen, okay? So keep that in mind that friction is a reactive force. It reacts to what's needed, okay? And this will come up for us later in the class because you can't always assume that friction equals mu Fn. If it's not, if you're not pushing on it hard enough to begin with, it doesn't. Mu Fn is an upper limit of friction, not necessarily what it is. 
So we good with that? So friction is a reactive force. It's not active, it's reactive. It reacts to what's happening. Okay. All right. Now let's look at uh, an example here. You might need to sketch this up. I don't think I've got this. Let's say we got this 40 Newton block. That's the weight. We're going to push it up a 25 degree ramp. With, so we got a 60 Newton horizontal force pushing the block up the ramp. It's a 25 degree angle there. All right, now when you got this ramp stuff going on, generally speaking, you, can, you need to come up with a set of axes parallel and perpendicular to the ramp. So there they are. And yeah, I think we got to maybe sketch this one up. I don't think I got this in the book. So when you get on these ramps and you got, fric uh, you got friction, you end up doing a bit of trig, okay? So I would set up a set of axes parallel to the ramp and perpendicular to it. And then I'm going to get a free body diagram going to the block. Okay? So what I'm going to have here is 40 newtons down and 60 newtons like that. And then what else am I going to have? I'm going to have a normal force and a frictional force. Now the other stuff going on here is I think that's going to be at 25 degrees. And I think this angle right here, which sometimes we, you know, we want to nail this thing down. I draw a line normal to the ramp, that also will be 25 degrees. Okay. So if this is 25 degrees here, let's see what's going on. And that's 90. Put in a vertical line and see what we can do with that geometrically to show that this is also 25. Because this is the general rule. A weight of an object on a ramp makes the ramp angle with the vertical. No, no, I'm sorry. Makes the, uh, I've got the wrong arrow in there. <laughs> there, that's what I want. There. Okay. So let's have a look at where that would come from. This is the weight is what it is. Now where that comes from is a sketch like that. So in our example, that's 25. 90 minus 25 will get us what, 65? So this is 65. That's 65. So this comes back to 25. That's kind of how that goes, all right? So I make a series of right triangles. Wherever the weight contacts the ramp, I drop that line straight down and get a right triangle. So that vertex angle of the ramp is 25. So 90 minus 25 gets me this angle up here. And then I can go opposite angles and get the same angle right there. Then with that weight and the two components of the weight shown as another right triangle, I can get... Uh, this angle up here at 25, okay? So the bottom line is whenever you got an object on a ramp, its weight makes the ramp angle with a line perpendicular to the ramp. And that's how we do the geometry on that, okay? So that's something I kind of remember because little ramp things seem to come up sometimes. All right, so now I can get a free body diagram going to this thing. So I've got the 40 Newtons and the 60 Newtons with those angles. And then I go a sum of F Y prime with this to find that normal force, which is what I want. 
So when you're doing this stuff, just be a little conscientious on this to get your trig worked out. Okay. So I'm going to have sum of fy prime is zero. I got minus sine 25 times the horizontal push. That's going to push the block down on the ramp. So that's negative sine 25, 60. Then I got minus cosine 25 times 40. That's the weight. And then I got Fn. So Fn comes out to be 61.6. And it looks like I kind of lost a number in here for some reason. Is that 25.3? I think it is. All right, and then the friction would be mu times that, so the friction's 18.5. So when you're doing this stuff, take a little bit of time, set it up, find the normal force on the block. That's, that's what you multiply by mu to get the friction. Okay. So once you got the friction, then you can find the net force, and if you want, you can find the acceleration. Okay. So that's how we approach these. This frictional stuff is based on finding that normal force. So to get the sum of forces up the ramp, I got 20, cosine 25 times 60 minus sine 25 times 40. So I'm using those two angles and the push and the weight minus the friction. So the net force up the ramp is 19 newtons. Okay. So I do a bit of trig to get that normal force. Sum of Fn is zero. It's not accelerating that direction. So I could use that equation to find Fn. And then I go sum of Fx prime is Ma. Or excuse me, sum of Fx prime, I'm just finding the net force, 19 newtons up the ramp. And then now I, if I want to, I can find the acceleration up the ramp. Okay. So that 19 newtons then on the left, those are forces and components of weight and friction and all that. That's going to equal my mass, which to find, I took the, gra the mass, excuse me, the weight divided by gravity over here. And then I've got those uh, components of the push up the ramp, the cosine 25 times 60. That gets me this component right here. And then I've got minus sine 25 times 40 which is that component of the weight going down the ramp and then i've got the friction minus also and that's going to equal the mass times ax so ax prime is 4.66 up the ramp what that is Are we doing all right with that? We got any questions on that thing? Okay. All right, now let's, uh, if we're okay with that, let's have a look at some other examples here. Let's say we've got this crane and we're going to lift this thing upward so with a constant acceleration. Let's, uh, let's find the maximum acceleration we can lift that block with. Okay. So we've got the cable and the cable's rated to uh, six tons. A ton is 2,000 pounds. So we got the cable can go up to 12,000 pounds. Now the object weighs 10,500, so I can divide that by gravity and get the mass in slugs, 326.
So why don't we get a free body diagram drawn of that block down there at the bottom. Let's do a dynamics free body diagram. So let's get the uh, um, acceleration on there too. So what I want to know here is I'm going to assume constant acceleration and I want to know how quickly I can lift that thing 24 feet with my cable that's rated at 12,000 pounds. So you probably want to figure that the cable is pulling with 12,000 pounds. Take it right out to its limit. Okay, we got the tension up, the weight down, and the acceleration. Doing alright with that? So the rope pulls up, or the cable, the weight acts down, and there's an upward acceleration. Alright, so given that, why don't you set up an equation the way I was showing there. Static stuff on the left, dynamic stuff on the right, and get the, uh, watch your signs, okay? So 12,000 up, 10,500 down. That's just what you do in statics. But it doesn't equal zero anymore, okay? So I just do statics on the left, just like what I'd do if that were statics. But now on the right is what I do with dynamics with, the mass times the unknown acceleration. And I can walk through that and solve for that acceleration. Y'all okay with that? Okay. And, and I don't know, like I said, I don't know if you did it this way in physics or not, but this is how I'll present it. I'm going to be real consistent this way, okay? Because it's kind of a simple one, but when, when they get more involved, you got to stick with this and get it on the proper side of the equation and the proper sign. Because if you bust either one, it'll, it'll, it'll get you a wrong answer. Even if, even if you get the proper sign, if you got the number on the incorrect side of the equation, that's just like a sign error. See, it's the same thing. So you got to be kind of aware of that, all right? Okay, we're good. Okay. And then uh, if I want to know how fast I can lift it, 24 feet, um, I just could use a constant acceleration kinematics equation, okay? Solve for the time, S equals S0 plus V0T plus 1 half ACT squared. I can solve for T, 3.23. Okay, so pretty common um, sequence there. Do the, ki the kinetics to find the acceleration. Once you got the acceleration, do the kinematics to figure out the time. We're assuming constant acceleration. You know, when they do this for real, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure they use very large safety factors, I would imagine, because, you know, this is one of the things you don't want to, you would never want to have a cable break. That would be obviously pretty bad. So, you know, I'm sure they they do some things to uh, account for any unknown variables sneaking in there, okay? 
that whole constant acceleration and assumption might be a pretty big one, you know. Okay. They also got to be careful how far they're leaning over and you get dynamic moments and all that that can tip the things over. There's a lot of stuff going on with this, so I'm sure they're, you know, it's been looked into a bit. Come up with safe procedures. All right. We good? All right. Now let's look at a dynamic reaction here. We won't consider the moment. Let's just look at the force reaction if we're okay with this. Let's find the reaction on the bottom of the, of the crane. If we're lifting that thing at 4.6 feet per second squared. So this is down at the bottom there. There's our free body diagram. So we got a reaction. We've got the weight of the body of the crane. And then we've got the weight of the um, block we're lifting. We're, we're going to ignore the offset of the weight and boom, we just want to get a force reaction here. Okay. Now, if we uh, do a sum of Fy on this thing, that's how we'd want to solve it. Let's see what we could do with this, all right? So, the, the important thing here when you do this is you're going to go sum of f y equals, and then that's going to be m a y is what that's going to be. This part here, we just look at what's accelerating, okay? That's the one part of this you've got to pay a little bit of attention to here. So what I'm going to have is that reaction up minus the two weights. The weight of the object that's being lifted plus the weight of the crane. You know, if it was statics, I'd set that equal to zero, but it's not, it's dynamics. So, what I, what I got to put on the right is the mass of only what's accelerating, not the mass of the whole crane, but the mass of this block here, which I've already calculated, that's 326. And then I've got its acceleration. Okay, so when I'm doing this, I don't include the entire mass. I just put in the mass of the part that is accelerating. All right. So we all right with that? And that'll get me to that reaction. See, I pick up a little bit of extra force on account of that reaction because I'm lifting something too. That'll that'll create a little bit more of a reaction down there. Okay. Right now, why don't we look at one other, this one on 310, if we're good with this one, we're doing all right. So, so the key facts here are F equals MA, forces and weights on the left, mass and acceleration on the right, watch your signs, and also just include the mass of the part that accelerates when you're doing the MA. Because if it isn't accelerating, it, it's not dynamic. So okay. Now let's have a look at this one. Now this one has a few kind of angles and such going on. So I, I did a lot of the work for you there already on, on the trigonometry and all that. So I did a bunch of the trig there where, under where it says block B. So what I'm going to do here, I've got a little two block system. I've got that heavy block A that's going to drag B down with it. I got a little pulley there that uh, changes the direction of the cable. So what I've done here is I want to find how much, what's the mass of A required to, just to make it start to move and then what is the mass of B that's required to make, um, make the system accelerate at two meters per second squared, okay? So two things. I've got, uh, for block A, I've got the weight of A is nine times eight one, because I'm in metric, that's gravity, times whatever the mass of A is. Block B, I kind of went through this long kind of song and dance here to get everything broken up into components so I can set up that X prime, Y prime axis system. So what I did there was I took the mass of B times gravity to get the weight, 88.3. 
I took sine of 17, which is the ramp angle, and cosine 17 times that to get the two components of weight that are along the ramp, 84.4 down and 25.8 parallel to the ramp. Okay. Then I did a sum of Fy equals 0 and found that the normal force is 84.4. And then for my part one, to just start B moving, it's not moving yet, so I'm going to do static friction there. Coefficient is 0.4 times the weight, it's 33.8. So this whole business here is boiled down into that sketch. We got the tension pulling that block down the ramp. We got the component of the weight down the ramp, which is 25.8. And we got the friction pushing up the ramp at 33.8. We've also got the normal forces here, too. Okay. So that's all kind of lined out. Now, let's set this thing up, okay? Now, we want to know what it's going to take to make this thing just start to move. So that's still statics, okay? Sum of F is zero when we're doing this. So all I got to do here is for block B is the complicated one. I'm just going to set up a sum of Fx prime equation for that thing. So I'm going to get... 25.8, I'm calling down the ramp positive on this one, which, you know, I can do that. 25.8 plus the tension minus the friction, the 33.8 is zero. And I can solve for the tension. So to just get that thing to start to move, to just equal friction, I need 8.88, excuse me, 8.00 newtons. So the idea there is if that tension was 8.00001 newtons, then it would just start to move. So I found that threshold when it's just going to take it to start to move. And that's just a statics problem. I did a bunch of trig up above, got everything squared up to the x and y prime axes, and did some of fx prime is zero. Okay? So if that tension is 8 newtons, that'll, that'll equal the friction. Just a little bit more will start that thing to move. That's the idea. All right? So what's next here is if that's 8 newtons, well, this is 2, okay? Because that friction is small and frictionless. Or the, the pulley is small and frictionless. So now I can solve for the mass, okay? That's basically what I do. That's the process to solve this thing. So again, I'm doing statics. I got some of Fy is 0. I got 8 newtons up minus the weight down, which is 9.81 times whatever the mass is, and that equals zero. So I can solve for the mass. It's 0.815 kilograms. So if the mass of A is 0.815 kilograms, the tension in A will be 8 newtons. That'll pull on B and just start the thing to move. That, that's what I just found. I started at B and worked my way around. Okay. Now, what I want to look at here for dynamics is part two. But everybody good with that process there that I just went through? All right. All right. So I'm going to do some dynamics now. Now, the point I want to make here is I've got the same free body diagrams with the one exception is now I want to make the thing accelerate at two meters per second squared. So the changes in the free body diagram are one, I put that acceleration on there. So I got it here, and I got it here. And the other is the friction changes a little bit because I don't have static friction. I got kinetic friction. So instead of being 33.8, which I had up above, now it's 30.4, slightly less because it's kinetic friction. But what I want to get at here is the process is the same as statics, except the forces don't equal zero. They equal MA. Okay? That's, the, that's the difference. So when I go sum of F now, it's sum of Fx prime is Max prime. So I got the same stuff over here. I got 25.8 down the ramp. I got plus the tension minus 30.4, which is the new friction, a little bit different than before. But that doesn't equal zero anymore. It equals the mass of B times the acceleration, which is 2. I can solve for the tension, just like before, it's 22.6 newtons, okay? So what I'm trying to get at here is doing dynamics is just like doing statics, 
except the right hand side of the equation changes. That's the difference, okay? That's how I want you to do it. So I solve for the tension. Notice it's quite a bit more to make the thing accelerate. So that's 22.6, it's right here. And that's the same tension as I got over here. And once again, I'm gonna set up the same equation there under A. Sum of Fy is Mayy. So I'm calling positive up, so that tension is up. The weight is down. And now I don't have it equal to zero. It's equal to minus two, because it's going, going down for that acceleration. So that's minus times whatever the mass is, okay? So notice I can't just take this tension and solve for the weight directly. I gotta go F equals MA on the left, okay? All right. So I got 22.6 minus 9.81 M is equal to negative two M. Again, I'm being conscious about my signs. I go ahead and solve and I get a good bit more mass required to make the thing accelerate. It's 2.89, okay? So there you go. So that's, that's how I want you to do this stuff. And I'll, I'm gonna, uh, you're gonna get tired of me saying it, but I, 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 it takes a while for people to kind of get their heads around it, so you'll have to put up with me, okay? But I'll say that a lot, that, that approach, okay? All right, so why don't we do a couple of these? And these will be due Friday. So why don't we do one of those relative motion ones? I'll hand this one out. So this is 174. I don't think we got this in the package. I don't think I ever updated it. I'm pretty sure I did. Let's see. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I don't think you do. Oh, you do. Page 7A? Yeah, 7A. Now, some of you might, if you got an older packet from the winter, you might. Oh, I don't mind having a piece of paper if you got it. You don't think you got it, you're not sure it's safe. I'm pretty sure I have it. Just take it. Yeah. If you got an older packet, because what I do, I take these packets every, you know, so let's let's do that one and let's do a couple more too. So 174, that looks like that's in the uh, packet. Now it's available for download if you need it, if you're online. And then 181 and 182. And these will be due Friday, okay? If I can make this thing right. There we go. 181, 182. And these are due Friday, which is the 19th. All right, there we go.